moved to Manchester, New Hampshire, which is the largest city in New Hampshire, um, around about the time I was going to junior high. So I stayed there through high school and through college years. It, it was a, a nice place. The town embraced us. Uh, my father was the Episcopal priest in town. We had a nice small lifestyle, nice sheltered lifestyle where we had a, a nice support system. You know, the father's the priest, so he's got to sort of be on display. If there is such a thing, the typical priest's wife where you know, make sure everybody's happy and we host events and dinner parties or whatever and then the kids have to look perfect and sit in church and sit still and we tried very hard to, you know, to have a typical lifestyle. I was the first child, the old, oldest child. My, uh, my parents really didn't know what they were getting into, I guess, at that point, have, not having children before, so they went through what they would consider their typical pregnancy. Uh, you know, it was a time that there were no sonograms. My mom would tell stories after that, you know, I would sort of tumble head to foot inside her belly, not sort of the normal role, but sort of a different role, and she asked the doctor, you know, is he supposed to roll this much? And of course the doctor thought that's, you know, just a normal first pregnancy question. My wife and I had talked about having children, and we're both interested in that. I was a young beginning minister at age 27, I guess, and my wife was a year younger. In the spring, she it turned out she was pregnant and we were both just thrilled. There was a lot of excitement, starting a new job, moving to a new city, beginning my work to assist in a very large and active parish. On the uh, 1st of December, I preached on what Advent was about that morning, and I used the idea of having a baby as the example, how you prepare for it, you get the room ready, but uh, until it's there, it's not there, and that's a little bit like Christmas. My wife didn't feel like going to church that morning, and I got home from church, and she had fixed a turkey dinner for the two of us. I said, what on earth? And she said, well, I just felt like cooking today. And then she said, well, actually, I'm having uh, some contractions. So we timed them, and, and we went into the hospital um, five or six o'clock in the evening. The gynecologist who had uh, been with us and was a parishioner uh, that we liked very much was had gone hunting somewhere. So he was not available, and, and some other man in his practice was available. Eventually, the doctor said, I think we'll have to do a cesarean. Uh, things are not progressing quite the way they should. And it was probably uh, 9.30 or so in the evening, finally, the doctor came out that I had never met before, came to the door of the waiting room, and he held out his hand, and he said, Mr. Robinson. I said, yes, and he said, come here. He said, well, there's a, a major problem with your uh, your child, there's, uh, he doesn't seem to have any arms below his elbows and, and very uh, short legs, and so, but he seems to be healthy. So come up and see your wife. So I was just, uh, just uh, I guess in shock at that point. And so it was a very uh, horrendous evening for us. As soon as I saw him, I could see instantly he was a Robinson. I recognized his face. And as they kind of moved the blankets for me to see him, he screamed and cried loudly, very vigorously. And they had told me he was strong, could breathe well. And so I thought, you go right ahead and scream. You uh, have a right to scream. It's not fair. They put him back in the incubator and, uh, and kind of took me away because I was having trouble standing up at that point. I think one has a mental image, or I did, about what a son or daughter would be. And uh, in my case, uh, I was not athletic. I was uh, better at music. So I thought, well, if I have a son, I'm going to work to see that he's more athletic and can run and do these things better than I can. The experience becomes more like a death uh, than a birth. In this case, it's the death of some of those hopes and dreams the death of your image of what this baby could be, of the death of some of the things you have thought about in the future. And people's reactions are kind of like that, and they gather together, if you have good friends, and kind of as one would after, for a death, after a death. The next day after John was born, um, she said, I, I, can't, I can't look at him. I can't stand it. And so she, she wouldn't see the baby. 
And I thought, what on earth will I do with this, my wife and with this baby? Something has to be done. And then the doctor came back from hunting, the doctor we knew and cared about. And uh, he said to her, you know, when you buy a new car, you don't know how it's going to be, you don't know how it's going to work out. But she, he said, uh, what about if you took him home for a while and see how it goes? And I would suggest, you know, you hold him and see how it feels. So she agreed, and he stood with her, and then they got me, and, and they brought him in, the baby, my son John, and uh, put him on my wife's lap in the bed, and, and they undressed him. We undressed him together so she could see what he looked like. And from that moment on, of course, she recognized her baby. <laughs> 